Welcome to Gator Bites, the official podcast of the Maryland Davies College of Business. I am your host, Miguel Gomez, and with us today, we have Elvira Rodriguez, also UHD alum, class of 2003. Welcome to the program today. Thank you for having me. Um, Elvira, please tell us about your role at UHD. What is it that you do and some of the day-to-day responsibilities um, in your job? Yeah, sure. So I've been with University of Houston downtown for about 23 years now. I started as a student worker in financial aid while I was getting my degree. Um, I graduated in 2003. So I moved from student worker to counselor um, on up to my current position as assistant director of customer service and outreach. Um, So my primary duties is managing the front counter, um, making sure that, you know, if there's any issues that I'm taking care of those issues, any, you know, questions or concerns students have usually come through to me. Um, I'm responsible for handling any dissemination of information that goes out um, from our office, um, whether it's on the website, through social media, and so forth. In a way, you're the official source of the information. Somewhat, yes. I love that. (laughs) Well, you know, there's been a lot of major changes to Mm -hmm. FAFSA this year, and I'd like to dive right on in, you know, just from the start. What are some of the major changes to FAFSA application this year? And um, please just walk us through it. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, this was a major overhaul of the financial aid application. We haven't seen something this major in over 40 years. Um, So it was a complete overhaul of the application. Um, So some things, highlights of changes that were made. One big thing is the formula that is used to determine their eligibility changed. Um, They changed the naming convention, but they also changed the elements that are used in the formula uh, to determine needs. So previously, uh, when a student completed the FAFSA, at the end they would get what's called an expected family contribution, um, and it would be a number, and that number would uh, tell us whether or not the student qualified for Pell Grant as well as other need-based aid. Um, That is no longer in place. It is now called Student Aid Index. It is still a formula that's being used to determine the eligibility, but the items that they're looking at to get that number have changed some. Um, So that's one thing. And and the the intent behind the change or the the changes was they were hoping to expand eligibility to more low-income families. Um, So when they're looking at eligibility now, they're looking at, you know, the amount of people that are in the household, as well as what the income poverty level threshold is for the state that the student resides in. So those things are now being taken into consideration um, when determining eligibility. Um, Another big change with the application, they did reduce the amount of questions that are being asked. So we know in the past students have kind of felt overwhelmed because it was quite a bit of questions. There was like over 100 questions on the application. So they reduced it to less than that, to about 49 questions. Um, So that was another change. And then another change was um, now there's something called uh, contributors, um, which is essentially anybody who has to provide their information on the application. So a student's a contributor. If they're dependent where they need to provide parent information, their parent is a contributor. If they're an independent student who is married, their spouse is a contributor. So anybody who's been identified as a contributor has to go in and give their consent to have their tax information uh, transferred into the application. So that is a big change. Um, As opposed to in the past, you know, the information could be manually inputted. They also could use what was called the data retrieval tool where they could link their tax information to their application. This way, it's behind the scenes that the information is coming directly from the IRS. Um, And so it is to make the process a little bit easier because that is probably one of the bigger um, problems that students struggle with is completing that tax portion of the application. So the fact that they don't have to go in and manually enter it and it's being put in automatically from the IRS helps and we know that the information is accurate. Um, So that was another change. Um, They also removed the number of college in the formula to determine eligibility. Um, Previously, when they were looking at eligibility, they were looking at how many people were in the household as well as how many were in college. So college size is no longer a factor. It is still asked on the application, but it's not a determining factor in their eligibility. Um, In regards to the household size itself, before the student would self-report how many people were in the household, now it's based on the number of exemptions on the taxes. So those are just some of the major things that do come to light as big changes that students will notice with this new application. I'd like to follow up on the contributors portion Mm -hmm. that you mentioned about these new changes. Mm -hmm. A lot of students that are part 
of our community more often than not don't want to involve their parents or they might not want to include them whenever they're uh, filing mm -hmm. for financial aid and in a way it's a barrier it sort of mm -hmm. dissuades people mm -hmm. or individuals who might be eligible mm -hmm. but may choose to not do so out of mm -hmm. privacy concerns mm -hmm. um, can you walk us a little bit about you know what would a student do in that situation yeah definitely so one of the other things with the application is there is a question on there um, in regards to being able to provide parent information. Um, so if they have a special circumstance as to why they cannot provide that parent information, they can indicate on the application they have a special circumstance and the application will be able to go forward. Um, so there is that. There is also a question on the application that does ask if the parent is refusing to give information, which is a little bit different, right? So if the parent is refusing to provide their information, unfortunately, the student won't qualify for federal funding because if they've been identified as a dependent student, then parent information is needed, right? So the only way they can get around that is if they do have extenuating circumstances that would prevent them from being able to have access to that parent information. So there is that new question on the application that if the parent, you know, if your parent refuses to give their information, check, you know, yes or no. Um, and that has been a big problem. We've noticed with this application, students have been very confused um, the wording of the question is not very clear. Um, and so a lot of students were incorrectly answering that their parents were refusing to give their information, which was not correct. So we did have a lot of students have to correct that. But there were some students that, you know, were indicating parents are refusing to give their information. And if that's the case, unfortunately, the only thing they'll qualify is an unsubsidized loan. But if they did indicate that they had that special circumstance, um, then we would follow up with the student and they have an option to do a dependency appeal and appeal why they need to be considered independent of their parent. As for students who are independent, mm -hmm. uh, walk us through at what age is someone independent? Like yeah. who is considered independent? So 24 or older is considered independent according to Department of Ed's rules, yes. At that point, you can navigate the application a little bit more differently as to someone who's still a dependent underneath their parents. Correct. So they look at several factors when determining um, who's dependent versus independent. So there is a dependency section on the application where they ask them questions and either respond yes or no. Um, so things that they're looking for is age, if they're 24 or older or not. Um, are they married? Do they have dependents who they provide more than 50% support for? Um, are they a veteran? Those kind of things um, are taken into account. We do have a lot of students that are like, well, you know, they may not be the age of 24, but they live on their own, they're self-sufficient, um, and they, they feel like they should be considered independent. Um, unfortunately, Department of Ed doesn't see it that way, right? They still see you as a dependent on your parent unless you meet one of the conditions to be considered independent. So I'd like to pause for a second mm -hmm. uh, in terms of FAFSA. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned military veterans, mm -hmm. uh, but there are other students and other grants that your office deals with, correct? Right, so we not only award like the federal Pell Grant, which is the one that everybody knows about, we do have state grants and we have an institutional grant that we do offer our students. Um, when it comes to the state grant, we have the Texas uh, grant, which is, there's two ways students can qualify for that grant. One is if you're an incoming freshman out of high school and you met certain criteria when you graduated from high school, meaning they took certain courses while they were um, in high school, they potentially could receive Texas grant. Um, the other way is if you are a student coming in from a two-year college and you got your associate's degree um, and you enroll in a four-year university within 12 months of getting that associate's, you could also potentially receive that Texas grant. Uh, we also have another grant called Texas Public Educational Grant, um, which is just a state-funded grant that we get. Um, it is first-come, first-served basis, so we only get so much funding, so we award it up until we have funding. Um, and then institutional, we do have a uh, mandated tuition grant that we offer for our undergrad as well as graduate, and that one also is limited. So we award it on a first come, first serve basis. It sounds that there is a lot of challenges in terms of being able to keep up with the timelines and in mm -hmm. terms of availabilities of funds. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask you, what are some general timelines that students should always be looking at, whether it's annual mm -hmm. or whether when it comes to even renewing as well? Yeah, definitely. So this year was a little different uh, because of the new application. They did delay the release, but starting this new year going forward, it will revert back to the original timeline. So the new application, um, I know it's crazy to think looking forward to 25, 26, but it would come out this October 1st of 2024. 
and that would be for the next school year. So it always comes out October 1st. Um, and then we put a priority deadline in place of April 1st every year. So what that means is if we can get the students to complete their application, submit all their required documents into our office by April 1st, meet, meeting that priority deadline, then they'll have priority in getting reviewed and they will know in advance what kind of assistance they will have for the upcoming year. Now it doesn't mean if they don't meet that priority deadline, we're not gonna review them, we still will. Um, we just can't guarantee you know, how soon you'll know something if we get your application after that priority deadline. It sounds like timeliness is a big part of the day-to-day -day that mm -hmm. your office deals with. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to just ask you two different perspectives. Sure. What does applying for financial aid look like for an incoming student? Mm -hmm. And what does it look like for an in currently enrolled student Mm -hmm. uh, who also needs to keep in consideration compliance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. For an incoming student, I mean, they're, it's their first time navigating the process of applying. So they're learning everything from what it is to start the application to what they may need to submit after that application has been submitted, because sometimes we do need additional documents. Um, and then just letting them know that, you know, this is something you got to do every year. Sometimes students think that once they've submitted it the first time, they're done. But it is an application that has to be completed year to year. So just making sure they understand that and, you know, how important it is to complete it early um, and not wait until the end. Because as you indicated, you know, timing means everything. If they're submitting, you know, their application in the summer, right before the start of the fall term, that's kind of late, right? So you want to try to get it in way before then. So that's why we kind of push that priority deadline. Um, for our continuing students, it's just, you know, also getting, making sure that they understand, hey, you need to renew your application. Um, you need to be sure that you are doing well in your courses because we do review that in determining eligibility to receive financial aid year to year. A lot of students sometimes don't understand that we look at their GPA, we look at that they're completing their courses and so forth to determine that they can continue to receive financial aid year to year. I'd like to ask about those GPA requirements. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is a good minimum GPA to have, ideally, to remain in compliance? So if you're an undergraduate, it does have to be a 2.0 or higher. If you're a graduate student, it's going to be 3.0 or higher. And that's just UHG GPA that we look at. We don't look at any outside GPA. So if we have a transfer student coming in, um, we're not looking at their transfer GPA. We're only going to be looking at their UHG GPA. Now, on to in terms of finding strategies for students to maximize their eligibility mm -hmm. and in turn maximize their uh, assistance that they might receive in the school year. What are some general tips that you can give to students to uh, make the most of the resources available through applying? Yeah, so number one is applying early. As soon as that application comes out October 1st, they need to apply. Um, we encourage them applying early maximizes your chances at those funds that are awarded on a first come first ba first basis. It's not a guarantee. We can never guarantee anything, but it does increase their chances at having access to those funds because again, the later you wait, those funds may be exhausted by the time we review you uh, to determine what you're going to receive. Um, other things that they can um, look into is our scholarships, right? The university has a wide range of scholarships available to students, whether they're incoming freshmen, a continuing or a transfer student. So we did recently launch our scholarship portal um, or scholarship center. So students can go online and they can actually complete a one application and apply for a range of scholarships from the institution. And not only that, once they do submit that application, it will give them a list of additional scholarships that they may meet the criteria for that they can apply for. So um, that is definitely another resource that students want to make sure they utilize. I think it's really important that you brought up the one-page portal mm -hmm. because one of the preconditions that we found in the College of Business is that you have to apply for financial aid, mm -hmm. uh, either FAFSA or TAFSA, to demonstrate the need and to be able to qualify for these scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, can you walk us through that process and like, how does it sort of go hand in hand? Yeah, a lot of scholarships are looking at financial need, and so they will want to have the student have a FAFSA on file. Um, so we always encourage our students to submit it. Um, not, And we always tell them, don't be discouraged from submitting it, even if you don't think you're going to qualify for maybe financial aid, but you may still qualify for that scholarship that you're applying for. Um, and then let them know that necessar not all scholarships necessarily need financial need information. Um, but to still apply for as many scholarships that they possibly can. There's no limits to the amount that they can apply for. Wow. 
Now, I'd like to ask you about first generation college students. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we, as first generation college students, might not have someone who has had that experience of mm -hmm. going to college. So they don't understand the nuts and bolts of mm -hmm. what it takes to be able to finance your education. Mm -hmm. um, what does your office outreach look like in terms of working with first generation students mm -hmm. and finding ways to be able to uh, get them to apply? Yeah, so we do various um, outreach efforts throughout the year from obviously recruiting uh, students from the high school level um, and letting them know what the process is to apply for financial aid, what kind of assistance is out there. And then for our students that are existing here on campus, you know, we do events. We have one big one that we do, which is the financial aid fair. Every year we host it in February because that is Financial Aid Awareness Month. And so we take that as an opportunity to one, give students an opportunity to come in and do their FAFSA for the upcoming year. Um, but also to provide information about, you know, financial aid options available. And then we do have a little fun in there. We have some games and we do bring in other departments to come in and highlight their services. And we have food and a DJ and it's kind of fun. So just throwing some fun things in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also partner with outside uh, community partners to come in and do presentations. Most of the time they are virtual, um, covering a wide range of topics from, you know, financial literacy topics. So anything from budgeting, saving, how to find scholarships, um, a various array of topics uh, to assist our students. I'd like to ask you specifically on Financial Aid Fair Month. Mm -hmm. um, what is what is what does essentially that look like? Whenever uh, you guys are having outreach to the high schools, um, it's like you're starting them off at a very early stage. Yeah, so we get uh, called into a lot of sc high school visits. We do partner um, with admissions because they're already out there recruiting. And so we will tend to tag along and we will, you know, not only speak to the seniors, but sometimes the juniors um, and even sophomores um, and just letting them know, hey, this is what you have to look forward to. This is what you need to start doing when you hit your junior or senior year, um, how to prepare to start applying for financial aid and what they need to you know, start gathering like the information that they'll need to have on hand when they do start the application process. Um, you know, on campus, we have big events such as Destination Downtown, where we also bring in, you know, um, the incoming class, hopefully, of students interested in coming to UHD and talking to them about financial aid and what they need to look forward to once they've started and how to maintain eligibility. Um, there's just all kinds of events that we try to partake in to be sure that we're getting the word out about how to apply, what types of assistance is out there, um, and how we can help them navigate that process. Whenever you guys go out and do your outreach, mm -hmm. do you get to ride it in the branded UHD like cars? We don't. I know admissions has <laughs> theirs. I'm like, man, why don't we have our own? No, we, unfortunately, we don't have a branded car, but I know the university does. I know admissions has theirs, which is pretty cool, but we don't know. That's a subtle plug for resources. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. No, well, it's been really informational to be able to sit down and ask you these questions, but I'd like to just close out on mm -hmm. FAFSA. Okay. And that's generally the bulk of, you know, these big changes that your office right. is dealing with right now mm -hmm. and helping students navigate. If you had to give a set of common uh, issues that students run into when they're filling out applications, mm -hmm. could you run me through it? And oh, what are some ways that oh students gosh. can go around? I know. <laughs> it's quite a bit. <laughs> we're, we're about to add 30 minutes to the- <laughs> I know, I could go on, no. Um, I'll just touch on, I think the biggest ones, and this is in regards to because of the new application and how it's changed. I think one of the biggest ones that we've run into is parents being able to go in and give their consent and provide their information on the application. Uh, we've been running into a lot of issues where they get the invite to go in and when they log in, they're not able to access. They don't see the student's application. And it usually has to do with there's some conflict, there's something that's not matching. So um, everybody who is a contributor has to have what's called an FSA ID, which is essentially your login to get into the application. So um, the parent has to create an FSA ID and whatever information they use to create that ID, that same information should be put on the FAFSA application. So when the student's going in and doing their application and providing parent information, they need to be sure they're exactly providing the same thing as what the parent did when creating the FSA ID, because if it doesn't, it doesn't know to link that it's the same uh, person. And so it could be something as minor as, you know, on your address, if you put, you know, street, like whatever, center street on the, account when creating the FSA ID, but you don't put it on the application, it 
you know, it's just something very minor as that. So we've been seeing a lot of students that their parents are not able to go in and give consent and just trying to figure out what's causing, why they're not able to uh, go in and do so. Um, another thing is our students with parents with no socials. That's a big one. So previously when a student would do a fast when their parent didn't have a social, they could not create an FSA ID because in order to have an FSA ID, you had to have a social. And so what those parents would do is when they did the FAFSA, um, the student would put zeros for their social for the parent and then the parent would have to sign a um, signature page and mail it into FAFSA because they could not electronically sign because they didn't have an FSA ID. Well, with these new changes, they made it where everybody can get an FSA ID even if you don't have a social. Um, however, they found that when the parent with no social would try to go in and give consent, it was not working to where the tax information could move over. So unfortunately, right now, those parents with no socials do have to manually go in and put in their tax information. They're not able to do the transfer over. Um, so we've had a lot of issues with the parents getting that FSA ID for one, because if their identity can't ver be verified, it, they can't continue with the application for the student. So there's been a, where a lot of our students have been on hold because they're waiting for their parent to get identified or verified, not identified, to be able to then complete the application. So um, yeah, it, that those are probably the two biggest ones. And then the third one would be, I would say that, that question about the direct unsub question, where if your parents are refusing to, to provide their information, uh, you'll only get unsub. A lot of students were incorrectly answering that question and they were getting a rejected on their application. I'd like to ask a follow up on the IRS information. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the most frustrating parts is having to reach out to the IRS yeah. and just being on hold. Mm -hmm. It feels like an eternity. Mm -hmm. um, just generally, what are some tips that you would give if a student has to reach out to IRS so then that way like they're prepared to be able to navigate? So it's really not even necessarily reaching out to IRS, it's, it's FAFSA. Department of Ed reaching out to them because if there is any kind of issue with whether it's because the parent can't access the student's application or the parent's identity hasn't been verified um, or any a range of issues that our students have been running into when doing the application, um, we, we can only do so much. We can help them with actually like trying to understand what the questions are asking. But when it's issues such as that, we can't do anything because it's not our, our website, right? So it really has to go through Department of Ed and uh, their group. And so because this is a world, well, not worldwide, but you know, across the, the US that everybody is navigating this new application, you know, our students are not the only ones encountering this these problems that we're seeing, it's everywhere. Yes. And so um, everybody's calling in and unfortunately they're not able to get through because they're over and they, you know, there's just too many people calling in um, that unfortunately, you know, there are long wait times trying to get through and it can be very frustrating. Um, and we completely sympathize with our students, but we tell them just keep calling, maybe call early in the morning before, you know, it starts to get busy during the day. Um, but they really do have to try to contact FAFSA to get the issue resolved. And we just try to, you know, navigate them how to get to that and do as much as we can to try to help as well. Two things came to mind. One, the idea of timing. So mm -hmm. just getting in there and applying as early as possible. Mm -hmm. So then that way you have time to navigate these unexpected challenges you might face, like mm -hmm. having to contact the Department of Education mm -hmm. through FAFSA, mm -hmm. correct? Right. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is understanding that this is nationwide. Mm -hmm. So um, you're not necessarily alone on this right. one, but there's a lot of people who are navigating these challenges. Mm -hmm. so yes, definitely. It's, it's all over, unfortunately. And like I said, just moving forward, we're hoping that, you know, Department of Ed is seeing what these challenges are and they're working on fixing those so that for come 25, 26, we won't hopefully have as many issues. <laughs> it feels so far away, but it's it, right it's around really the right around the corner. It's really <laughs> not that far. Yeah. No. Well, Elvira, I'd like to just ask you one last question. And this one's a little bit more off the cuff. Okay. You are an alumni mm -hmm. of UHD. Yes. And you've been here for quite some time. Mm -hmm. What does UHD mean to you? Wow. Um, I hope I don't get emotional, but you know, it's it's home for me. Um, I came here as a student, never had a job before, so started as like I said, a student worker, and um, just it really, I think it really helped me grow. Um, I was very much an introvert coming in, very shy. And working in financial aid, you 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 grow out of that real quick, yes. <laughs> you know. But it, it really has helped me in in that respect. And I've 
met a lot of wonderful people here. I feel like my financial aid uh, staff is my family. Uh, some people I've worked with, you know, for over 20 years. As long as I've been here, they've been here as well. So we've worked together a long time. So I just really enjoy the um, the staff that's here. We I think we work all well, um, especially in our enrollment management division. Shout out to EM. Um, I work with a really great team, and so I'm I'm a proud Gator. <laughs> Love to hear that. No, well, thank you so much for coming on to the program thank today, Okira. Thank you. Uh, this has been Gator Bites, the official podcast of the Maryland Davies College of Business. I am your host, Miguel Gomez, and we want to remind you to take a bite out of business, and we'll see you later, Gators. <laughs>